Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor, and today we're going to be talking all things Tom Cruise. What uh, you know, we got a whole lot of stuff because we got the the his his faith, how he was a Catholic at one point. Now he's a Scientologist. He's been in he's been a star for you know uh, almost uh, maybe four five decades almost. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate, but <laughs> yeah, but, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. That's five decades. And action hero almost the whole time, which is impressive at his age. So we, we're going to get into that. And I've got uh, the Supreme Pontiff uh, to my right, Jeff, the Supreme Pontiff. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as many of you know, if you follow me on Twitter, I am a big fan of dad jokes. I studied philosophy in college. I was a focused missionary, uh, now husband and father of three beautiful little girls. And I also really enjoy not only watching movies, but also taking time to like break it down and understand things, which kind of drives my wife nuts because I want to keep talking about something after we've watched it. But um, yeah, I'm really excited to be able to talk about this. Awesome. And uh, I don't know if you'll appreciate this, but I, I, when I went to, when I was at college and there were focus missionaries, I called them the Nazgul. So uh, <laughs> just so you know, you're, you were one of them. That's fair. We, uh, we do swoop down out of nowhere and we always go after the prey unceasingly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, to below us, we have Rick Barrett, uh, the armed Catholic, the one, the only. Welcome, Rick. Oh, it's always good to be here, Connor. Still surprised you asked me to be a part of any of these conversations, but always happy to be a part of them. Sometimes I surprise myself. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think it, this whole thing came about because uh, I think Rick had some tweet. I popped in and was like we should do a show and uh jeff popped under me and said can i be on and i was like yes let's do this thing yeah. and it's been it's been months in the making which is you know that's kind of rare for me to have a uh episode planned out mon months in advance but okay so i want to first sort of address the fact that tom cruise was you know he was raised catholic he was a seminarian for a period of time. And I want to just read sort of this rec uh, recounting of uh, the story um, that happened, that this other guy recounts about how he, how he and Tom Cruise basically were, uh, were supposed to leave seminary, had to leave seminary. So he went to uh, St. Francis seminary, uh, for two years in the 1980s and one night uh he uh this other guy joined Cruz in stealing uh liquor from the franciscan fathers uh this guy's name is dempler tossed bottles out a window to Cruz, who waited below uh, most broke but they managed to get a couple and hide them in the nearby woods the priest didn't realize until some of the other boys found out about the plan and snuck out into the woods and got drunk. They were caught staggering back to the road and they confessed. And uh, the school wrote a letter to the parents, basically telling them that they would prefer that the uh, that the seminarians did not return. And so they didn't. So I had to see forgiveness was uh, flowing pretty well from those guys all the way from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like nothing like using an opportunity to learn and grow. Yeah, it's an, also good thing they didn't do that to Saint Moses the Black. <laughs> what did Saint <laughs> Moses the Black do? He was a thief. Oh, they right. caught him in the act when he was at when he went to the monastery. They caught him stealing, <laughs> and they and so good good thing we didn't. Um, I'm sure somebody will find that and correct me. They were doing it. You know what I mean? It's the, <laughs> the essentialness of the story. I'm glad to see that uh, our our Catholic uh, our betters no better than us. Anyway, that's don't want to get off on it. So Franciscans are not forgiving. Is that the highlight of the story? 
Sure, yeah, but you can quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I I do think there needs to be a I, first. Um, most seminaries don't actually have a focus on development of virtue of human formation. There's really the focus is just on intellectual and spiritual formation, but not uh, you know teaching about virtues and how to grow in those. Um, so I think that that's first and foremost something that's absolutely lacking. But uh, beyond that, there does need to be some level of, you know, we don't know the backstory of what else he had been doing there. I'm not sure if this was a minor or a major seminary, you know, if he was more of a high school student or if he was, you know, in his mid 20s and doing this type of stuff. So uh, I do agree, Rick, there needs to be some grace involved. But I also think that, you know, if you're going off the deep end too much, then you're probably not cut out to be a priest. I mean, I'm being mostly facetious, and I agree with you in that regard. Yeah, that's fair. Well, it is. It is two years, so I, I not. I guess I could have been a, you know, yo- younger thing. I mean, he could have had a, a history of doing uh, these these things. Yeah, and it sounds that's like this might have been a last straw kind of thing. Possibly, but you well, know, could, could you imagine? It's basically, to be honest, it's almost like a movie. Could have been a movie. Yeah, well, it makes me think of Father Mike Schmitz, because uh, I believe he wasn't he like tapped to potentially play Robin at one point. Came in second. Really? Yeah. He Chris came in Thursday. second. He was supposed to be right behind Chris O'Donnell. Yep. Chris O'Donnell. Yeah. Is Chris O'Donnell was Chris o- is Chris O'Donnell a Catholic? I feel like he is. Or we know he's Robin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which was the problem with Tom Cruise. He yeah. was Robin. Uh huh. He was Robin. Thank you, Mister Punter. That was excellent. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, one thing I will also just add to it is we can look a bit at what Tom Cruise was doing. You know, not too long after if this was in the eighties, what movies he was in and the type of uh, morality that he was portraying and or glorifying shortly thereafter leaving seminary. And see that, you know, he may have been the right decision, you know, just from that alone. Because early on in his career, we have things like all the right moves where, you know, he is explicitly portraying himself as a Catholic, where like he has a crucifix on and they show him like taping over it to get ready for football practice. And then five minutes later, he's doing everything he can to, you know, basically convince his girlfriend to sleep with him for the first time. And then you also have risky business where he's, you know, working with a prostitute throughout the movie. Like there's just so much that like to have that immediate of a swing to being comfortable portraying that type of thing. um, You know, to me at least just, speaks to the possibility that the priests had a, you know, good insight into why they kicked him out or were mm-hmm. asked him not to return. Well, it seems like he must have been in a seminary before 18. Okay. So that'd be a minor seminary. Yeah. Because 18, he moved to, uh, he moved to New York city. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so he he uh so he's basically he has sort of the the some of the remnants I guess of Catholicism is that what you'd say, Jeff? Yeah, I I'd say he's at that point showing at best cultural Catholicism. Yeah, which would pretty much put him in line. I think I'm muted. No, which would put him in line with anybody that you would find today who would come out as a Catholic, you'll find them on Instagram with ashes on their foreheads. And then uh, you'll, you'll find them doing something. You're like, Oh yeah, you should probably not do that film. But yeah, yeah. I mean, Mark, we could easily go off and, and I don't want this to turn into a Mark Wahlberg bashing, but you know, some of the films he's done while going on Instagram every Sunday and saying like, stay prayed up. It's like, well, maybe you should too, bud. So <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't, 
I don't know if he uh I I always thought that he had said that he regrets doing a bunch a bunch of the movies he did do, but I don't know if that's um true. Well, I mean, he's still doing some movies that are questionable at best. <laughs> yeah, like, I didn't want to turn that that's a very I mean, we, yeah. you know. It, that's why I, I even hesitate to say it, but just as as an example, like you were saying, I could easily see if Cruz stayed in the faith being one of those like wearing a crucifix and then doing like I I mean, remember his wife Nicole Kidman was a Catholic, and I think she converted back after she divorced, divorced, and they both did eyes wide shut. So you know that's the kind of Catholic. I mean, she still claims to be a Catholic today, and she's eating bugs and doing all this other kind of stuff. So wonderful yeah that, <laughs> the, but when did so when did scientology get into the picture well, i'm trying to find that um, i think it really became at least a public thing late 90s early 2000s yeah and what what, what is the what draws people do you guys have any ideas what people what draws people to um this probably the connections they have so, yeah, and I, I would agree with that, Rick, but I'd also just say that it's partially a matter of, uh, in my opinion, you know, advertising and then psychological manipulation, where, you know, you're, uh, it's very Masonic, I, not in the sense of like being like, or being from the Freemasons, but in the way that masonry, you know, you start off as the first level, and then they slowly draw you in and give you a little bit more knowledge, like Scientology a huge tenet of theirs is that you can only present the information that they are capable of receiving at that point. So you don't get like, you know, the final end crazy knowledge until you're so deep in debt to them. You've spent so much money and yeah, you've made your entire life and all your friends in that group. So like it's a slow psychological manipulation to draw you further and further in. Sounds a little cultish absolutely yeah and so he joined in 86 because uh of his first wife interesting so love can be a dangerous thing wow oh. <laughs> that the truth uh, a lot of delilah there delilah syndrome and yeah. so basically she was into it i guess and he must, I mean, so it didn't take him very long, at least, to go from seminary to uh, um, Scientology, which it's crazy the difference between what a Franciscan is supposed to be and what a Scientologist is. Oh, I mean, not to play devil's advocate here, but I guess I will be. Well, what, what age are we talking? We're talking 18. I mean, sure. if he's 18 years old and in supposed love with a woman, oh, I'm no, sure he's, he's I not... can give you horror stories about my my 18 year old self and what I would have been willing to do to impress a lady, especially so, if I was supposed to be married to her. He wasn't 18 so, when he got yeah. married. Well, 24, right. he would have been 24 at the time of his conversion if it was 86. Yeah, it was 86. All right, let's scale that up. What do most studies say about the male mind? I'm Usually 24. not fully, fully formed or developed <laughs> until 25. I'm, I'm going to leave out my comments on you, Connor. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yeah, I'm, I I can understand a bit, but at the same time, you know, you, men used to get married on average, you know, looking at about 20. There's a lot of maturity that can be had. And especially if he wasn't deep into, you know, the Hollywood scene until, you know, shortly before that, he had the opportunity to, you know, be settled and strong in his faith, but instead opted for worldliness. And as we know, sin darkens the intellect, makes you stupid, and he chose a different path and was susceptible because of that, in my opinion. Well, he definitely was obviously susceptible e e during seminary, which, though, obviously, as we kind of discussed, he was pretty young. So it's mm -hmm. not, I think it's not surprising that he had a rebellious phase, you know, even in also, seminary. Being kicked, also being kicked out probably made him more likely 
to yeah. pursue something else because he felt rejected. Well, he also probably felt that it wasn't his vocation anymore. Or, or you know, if, if the whole idea is you're going to seminary because you have a call to the priesthood, if that's what he thought he had, which I guess we don't really know if that's what he thought he had. Uh, but uh, the way us Catholics think this way is if this, if he took this as just a decision that, uh, or, you know, a, a decision from God that he wasn't supposed to be a priest, I, I can see how he just, you know, sort of shut, shut the Catholic side off. And not to mention, I do think maybe the soul Scientology thing also, you know, I, I've heard it said that uh, if somebody has a vocation, it basically can haunt them their entire life if they if they run away from it. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's theologically correct or whatever, but um, but maybe this rebellious phase just comes out of him running away from his uh, his uh, sorry, yeah, his vocation. Though I I really think this latest Mission Impossible movie uh, shows a lot of I don't know, like he he gets maybe half of what's going on. Maybe, or he's just list, or maybe the writer gets half of what's going on. I felt like there was a lot of stuff within the uh, the latest Mission Impossible movie that um, I don't know that speaks to the person today, as well as maybe something more than just sort of the um, materialistic world. Any, uh, Rick, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, let me throw that back to you. How? What? Give me an example. So, I think one of the main aspects of that movie was the concern with truth. Basically, the villain of the movie is trying to take control of AI, or one of the villains, I guess. Like, there are a few villains trying to take control of this AI system. And this AI system is basically trying to alter what everyone sees as truth. Okay. Yeah. And, and to me, that's, and I mean, all the only thing we needed added to that was somebody saying, what is truth? We just needed a, a, a pilot character to be like, what is truth? And finally for someone to actually answer what that is, but you know, they don't go that far. Yeah, um, the the whole AI thing is very interesting, considering where we are now um, in in uh, the evolution of of AI and the questions that it brings up. I think if we're gonna kind of go that route, which is fine. Uh, the interesting thing is um, the fact that he is the only one out of everybody, of course, because it's. Tom Cruise in, in this film, and I will give him credit for being one of the few for being such a big enough star that he can leverage his cachet to not have himself be a pushover in his films. But he is the only one who thinks that the AI can't be controlled. Right. So I guess we can say there's that humility there because everybody else has pride and hubris that if they can get the keys, they can control it. They're the, you know, they can harness that power. And, and he is the only one that says this power, you know, it's almost like a rejection and I'm going re right off the deep end. You don't have to follow me. It's almost a reverse rejection of the apple. If you really want to think about that, right? Bite from the tree of knowledge and you'll get all this knowledge. You can look at the keys as that apple. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if you want to rope in Hay uh, Haley Atwell and the female and the fact that she's the thief and all that other stuff, go right yeah. ahead. Cause I'm going off the top of my head at this point. This is not, this was not pre pre-planned, no, but yeah, let's great. think of that that way. Um, you know, the key is the apple and he is the only one with enough humility for whatever reason mm -hmm. that he doesn't think he can control it where everybody else in man thinks they can. Well, so yeah. uh, really quick, this just actually ties into something we we're briefly discussing before that, in almost every appearance he has in a movie, Tom Cruise is the protagonist. Mm 
Mm-hmm. He's almost never the villain, and he's pretty much never a bit player. He is real the quick. Only, yeah, real quick. I, I don't mean his no. best performance, in my opinion, was Collateral when he was. I was. I actually just watched that recently because probably was, my favorite performance of his. Yeah, I was curious if he had been a villain before, and just seeing him in that was chilling. He was perfect for that. It's my favorite performance of his. It's probably one of my favorite movies of all time with him in that. Is yeah. He- yeah, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, I don't uh, want to spoil the ending. That's why I don't want to say anything okay. on Connor. Watch it. It's fantastic. Okay. It's probably his best film, if you think, like, one of his top five best films. I'm almost scared to watch him as a villain. <laughs> yeah, it's chilling. But anyways, getting back to just the main point you were making, like, he is almost the only one who can see the truth and, like, is pursuing that. Which, again, you know, we could even tie back to what we were discussing before with the rejection of the priesthood he still almost uh, and we don't know him personally so uh, but just from what he actually you know portrays himself as in movies he almost views himself it seems messianically Mm -hmm. right he is the messiah the only one who can do that and especially yeah just tying right back into the keys being the apple he's the only one rejecting it he's the only one that can save humanity well also just it's so what's crazy also is that this movie I think was supposed to come out a while ago. This movie was filmed during COVID. So hmm. and I'm pretty sure it was switched with Top Gun. It was supposed to take come out when Top Gun uh was planned to come out and they did a switcheroo um because I don't know why necessarily, but that's why the next movie is coming out next March. Like there's the sequel, the part two is coming out next March, which is pretty insanely fast. Mm-hmm. But it makes sense if if this has been filmed for such a long time. Uh, yeah, it's the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings style where you film it all at once and then you can have shorter releases rather than James Cameron waiting. You know, what is it? 13 yeah. years to release the second Avatar. Yikes. Well, also, did he plan? I don't think he planned that. Maybe he did. I think. Yeah, I well, think he's that uh, was done before. And that one was supposed to come out pre cough cough and Paramount wanted it on Paramount plus. And he said, no. And once again, he's one of the few people that could actually get that wish. So I guess that was the, the price was to, 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 you know, push off the mission impossible movie for it. Yeah. And then, so the other thing is, is that, the sort of the main villain is or one sorry not the main villain one of the main villains is also the, sort of the head of the intel all of the intelligence agencies and he wants to get rid of all old guard thinking which he he wants to get rid of old patriotism basically anything that is a remnant and wants to sort of remake everything in his in the image of this ai or the image of whatever he wants. And one of the things Donald Cruz says to one of the characters in the movie, and I think he uses the wrong word when he's talking to the, he says, uh, he says to the, the main villain who's trying to get the keys that, uh, something about the, the God you serve. But I was thinking, Oh no, it's the demon that you serve like he, he it, it's like he's he's kind of close he just he's just not it's just not getting it you know fully mm. like there's he's even adding some sort of spiritual element to it and it doesn't it didn't seem like it was just like a throwaway thing like he could have said something else he could have said master you know he could uh he could have said i don't know he could have said any other word but he chose like something, a spiritual word. What yeah. You, you want to jump on that, Jeff? Uh, no, yeah, you can go right ahead, Rick. No, thanks. <laughs> um, I just haven't seen uh, the newest Top Gun or newest yeah. um, Mission Impossible yet. So I haven't been able oh. to digest it. Yeah. So, so Jeff is yeah. right now. Uh, the, the whole idea behind that, and Hollywood does do this from time to time where they pass off just enough. Well, they used to 
And that's why the Tom Cruise films feel like a breath of fresh air because they're just copying the old Hollywood model from the 80s, 90s, early 2010s, where you could mention God, sprinkle in a little bit of religiosity, something that a platitude that could be kind of applied across all faiths. And remember, Scientology is con it is a 501c3. So according to the federal government, it is a religion. So there is that spirituality that is there as well. Um, so, you know, I, I do see where you're coming from, but uh, and this is not in any way, shape or form to push back on your point. The the whole because I just connected the keys to to the apple in the garden so can't really, can't <laughs> yeah, really go that far back but the the idea that um we have to be careful we have to be careful of extrapolating uh our own personal beliefs our beliefs onto the film which is kind of the point of that you know art uh, it art is supposed to be subjective and well done art is supposed to be able to have that broad appeal which is why you're seeing films bomb because they don't um but yeah the idea of you know the god that you serve christopher mcquarrie who wrote it and he wrote the first mission Impossible. he's wrote and written the last couple since he's been on uh he wrote the jack reacher film and directed that guy's an amazing director and ama an amazing writer if you look at his filmography i think he co he did the usual suspects uh, all the way back that way so he knows he's a he, he's not like all these hacks they're on the the picket line right now trying to you know get he's actually one of the few talented writers left mm -hmm. and he knows the wording that will get the most impact and like you said connor that does have the most impact you know because easy being like oh you're digital overlord it doesn't hit with the same amount of punch as really because it, it really also establishes the villain as a uh, as as a zealot and, and also, what he will do you know the fact that he's willing to kill and maim and destroy in the name of his his god so yeah as well as his uh sort of master as being all powerful mm -hmm. it, it, it mm -hmm. sort of it triggers that type of uh thought process one last thing i want to say about this movie and i'm really i, I agree with you rick that we really can't look too deep. It's just that I think there's a value of looking at movies that even mm -hmm. if they don't, if they, they're they not fully aligning with everything you're thinking or all of your beliefs, I think you part of enjoying movies that don't fully uh, line up, if you can, if you can see that even in sort of the, um, the sort of the, the jigsaw puzzle you can see it and you can find enjoyment in that by look by looking into that i agree yeah, yeah I agree. i'd say yeah true catholics should be able to see the good and you know learn lessons from you know even bad situation bad art but that doesn't that is a difference between that and then ascribing that same type of philosophy to those who produced it yeah the last thing I want to say about this this movie, and then we'll get to sort of we can go back in time and start and you know look more at his career as a whole. But I just know people are going to want to hear about the Mission Impossible movie right off the bat, um, and that is that he 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 takes pity on some on a character, and that pity comes back later uh, to help him. And it reminds me a lot of like Gollum and um, Lord of the Rings. And I don't know if the, that was on the mind of the writer, but it's just it's just a very Catholic way of thinking um, and not and not for that to then instead of, you know, like a, other writers tend to be where you 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 don't hurt someone you don't stop someone and then that person comes back to bite you or comes back to hurt someone you love very instead, saving private ryan there instead this one you know this helps him in the end i agree i completely agree in that regard that's i mean that you guys have been saying that and you know we should be able to find those the universal themes of forgiveness and redemption and the ability to give Second chances, third chances, right? How many times must I forgive Lord? Seven times, you know, 70 and 
and and all of those good lessons we need to take. Uh, and yes, once again, Cruz and a very few others seem to be taking these lessons that are universally applicable to all of us and actually applying them instead of trying to go the exact opposite. And so that's why I think people are, are finding these films refreshing in that regard, because there is something there to pick out. And yeah, I didn't catch the Gollum reference, but I think that's a very good one. You know, it, was, it could have been very easy in that moment for Ethan Hunt to take out vengeance and, and do what he needed to do. And a lot of people would have said, hey, it's the heat of the moment. Your life was threatened. Technically, you're fine if you wanted to. You could have because you didn't have to have mercy because mercy, you know, that was still a life and death thing. But it's also choices and the fact that we are a product of our choices. I know that's a line from the trailer. But doesn't make it any less true. Um, and, you know, one thing I preach when I talk about self-defense and the reason why you want to avoid conflict is because let's say you do, you know, my favorite thing is when I talk to people about like, you know, apocalyptic landscapes and how they're going to be wild west shooters and they're going to just stack bodies in the apocalypse, like walking dead style. Uh, I always say you have to understand the violence you will, you will put out there will always come back to you no matter what. doesn't matter if it's a week, month, year. If you kill somebody in some kind of defense thing, their brother, sister, son, blah, 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 whatever the case may be, somebody will feel that eventually, and they will try to take that violence back on you. And so long-winded way to say, yes, Connor, that's <laughs> the great example of the fact that you can make the choice uh, when modern society would want you to take a different path. Even I was in the, at the heart of the moment. I was like, why did he just do that? <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, uh, even I, you know, I was you like, just tried to strangle him out. It's not like they were having, you know, she was doing everything she could to try and kill him. Yeah. And I was like, and he even like, he, he used the pipe and like hit right above her. You know, I'm like, and I was like, why even waste the time? Why, like, why waste the time and hit above her when you, you know, anyways, it was just, uh, anyways, that's, uh, I also don't, I know I'm trying not to st completely spoil it for Jeff. Uh, don't worry about it. Anyways. Uh, no, because it's just, it is a very good movie then. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's the latest mission impossible movie, but let's, let's go back a little bit. So one of the big sort of, this wasn't a breakout movie by any stretch of the imagination, but this is probably, uh, this is one of his earliest movies, but I, and I, I've seen it cause I actually watched it in like grade school because we were reading the book. He was in the outsiders. Have any of you seen him in that? No. Okay. Anyways, no, no, I haven't seen that. Yeah. I mean, he's just one of the brothers or not one of the brothers. Is he one of the friends? Let me see. Um, basically he's just one of the sort of the street boys. Uh, yeah, no, I, he's not one of the, he's just a friend of some sort anyways. But the point is that he, you know, he's in that movie. That was one of his earlier, uh, movies, but, uh, we got risky business and all the right moves. So Jeff, do you want to talk about all the right moves a little more or do you have anything uh, more to say about it? I just, um, I, I stopped after like 20 minutes. Um, it seemed like a pretty like bare bones, um, high school football movie. And it's only an hour and a half, um, about a steel town in, um, Pennsylvania, I believe. I, I stopped pretty quickly just because it was very graphic in showing him trying to lead his girlfriend further into sin. Uh, so I didn't want to continue with that, but it seemed like a very, you know, bare bones, but still um, popular enough movie that like it was talked about in stranger things. Season one, that was something that uh, Steve asked Nancy if she wanted to go see all the right moves. So I, I was curious about it and didn't want to continue past that. Yeah. Well, and then risky business was his supposedly his breakout role. Um, or do you guys have any, either of you want to say anything about that one? I haven't seen that one either. So I can't really right. help on that. All right. Jeff, have uh, you seen it? it's been well over a decade. Um, but the, right, for anyone who hasn't seen it, you've at least seen or seen references to 
the most famous scene, which is him sliding in in the tidy whities and uh, button down shirt uh, for uh, right, singing along with um, that old time rock and roll. Um, again, it I don't think it's a movie that has many redeeming qualities. It was just very popular, probably indecent bit, just like very much early in his career, he was focused on like his personality and his charm getting him through things. And it was only a little bit later that we actually started to see him more as, you know, the action star. So that was just another example of him getting, uh, you know, smiling his way through things, getting into tight spots and then having to figure a way out because again, he's always brilliant and finds the way in his movies. Yeah. And it's interesting. There's a, uh, one of the things I've just noticed about movies in general is back in the eighties and maybe even the nineties, there were a lot more movies that took place in Chicago or the, or in the Chicago land area. And this is one of those movies. It's in the, it's in one of the suburbs of Chicago. That's where it takes place. So it's just interesting that that sort of, one of those things that has uh, changed over time mm -hmm. uh, where movies take place. Now it's basically exclusively New York or, or LA, you know, that type of thing. The uh, best one based in Chicago is absolutely rookie of the year. That's in what? Oh, he yeah, ends up as his yeah. cub. Sorry. I was thinking of the rookie, which takes place in Texas. Yes. Another uh, great movie, but yes. the best Chicago based one, in my opinion, is rookie of the year. Who's the uh, who's the sort of the good father figure in that? I can't say. I don't know. OK. Anyways, it's just I yeah, that is a good movie. Now, now we get to Top Gun. Top Gun was uh, 86 when he uh, the year he he lost his faith fully. At hmm. least. Um, I yeah. mean. That's an, it's an interesting one for him to like, this is where we start to see him as an action hero, but it's really an interesting spot to put him there. Or it's like, it's a really interesting transition because he's not actually like physically going and fighting anybody. The only time we see anything approaching, like the focus on physicality is the volleyball scene, but Everything else, like it obviously is a war movie, but he's, you know, in a cockpit. He's not actually, you know, out there personally fighting and having the same type of, you know, things that we see him doing today, literally hanging off of a plane as it's taking off. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of an interesting transition, but it is also one of the most quotable movies of all time, in my opinion. That's yeah. Right. Also, are... are the Soviets the villains in that? No, or it's just just generic. I mean, it's generic. Yeah, it's yeah, a red star. <laughs> yeah, I think that. So it's either yeah. China or communism. Communism uh, is the bad guy. Well, it's the '80s, so of course. Yeah, the funny thing about Top Gun is that they filmed it without the love story. Mm -hmm. The initial production, there was none. Yeah, uh, and sure. the test screenings came back and like what because this was the 80s and that was what you had in the 80s. You always had some kind of even if it was terrible, you still had something. <laughs> That's why they refilmed it. And the elevator scene, Kelly McGinnis had a different color hair. That's why she's wearing a hat mm -hmm. because she, could, she didn't have the blonde locks. So they kind of just threw a hat on her and said, don't get in the elevator. Uh, <laughs> and the whole thing at the house, take my breath away. That was filmed mm -hmm. in like a weekend. Because yep. they had to shoehorn all that in. So it's very interesting how they had to do all that. And that's why they used blue lighting for that. Because they didn't want her to wear a hat. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so they were just like... The trickery they had to do to just get that that love story in there. Um, is it, kind of funny. Because at first, there wasn't there wasn't any emphasis on it. Which is also why it, it's just so awkward. <laughs> the whole thing just feels so awkward. Um, the first time you've ever watched it, you're like, this is just weird. Um, so, yeah. except for the bar scene singing, you've lost that love and feeling is just perfect. Interesting quote. When, uh, when I used to play rugby, um, the, uh, one of the things they made the rookies do is you had to find a female rugby player on the other team and sing that to her. 
And actually, nice. I, that was my role. My first when I played uh, when I played rugby in my rookie year, uh, that was my job at the the ruck, the get togethers after. Because what rugby players will do is they'll beat the crap out of each other for ninety minutes and then split a keg, and mm -hmm. everybody will sit around the keg and and hang out. Um, and of course, my job was to sing "You've Lost That Loving Feeling" to some random girl from whatever school we were visiting or whatever <laughs> school we were visiting there. So I learned that song pretty much inside out. That's hilarious. Okay, that's uh, that's that's. You can quite thank Top Gun for that. Another uh, very awkward. Any, is there any chance we could ever get a nope. uh, recreation of that? <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. And good what luck about you, what about luckily, you cell phones weren't around back then. So, <laughs> outside of me telling the story, there is no visible proof of said thing. What about an Enoch skit? Nope. I love Enoch. But ain't gonna happen. I'm sure he'll he, he can. I mean, he'll do it. And it'll probably be absolutely perfection, but, <laughs> but not, with, but not with you. No, absolutely. Aww, not. Dang it. One of the really awkward moments is like in the uh, women's bathroom. Oh yeah. Like it's, yes. it's, it's, the whole thing is a little bizarre, but, uh, and now, pe and now there's this subset of people who think that it's all a homosexual movie. Well, go ahead, Jeff. You can jump on that one. So, this just pisses me off because it's not just about, you know, the homoeroticism of the, uh, you know, the beach volleyball scene. They're doing this everywhere like yes. where they're also. And the one that makes me the most mad is people trying to read into Sam and Frodo. Yeah. Like exactly. What that, I was say. Yeah. So it's not just happening here. It was. Or it was a good fun scene and they were trying to show off their physiques and give something for the ladies is my guess, but there was nothing actually homoerotic about it. Well, I mean, they tried to do the same thing and this is not as, as contemporary, but with Captain America and the winter soldier, oh, and their yeah. bond, their well, bond. Yeah, like, oh, they're obviously homosexual lovers. I'm like, they're both from the forties. <laughs> yeah. Like the expression of masculinity inc included, especially guys who went to war together, you know, that mm -hmm. idea of, of, you know, and that's why male bonding is so difficult today because they've turned it in such a way that any, any, um, male affection to any, another male has, is like, well, obviously you're a homo. It's like, no, that's obviously not the case. But, um, but the, but they, and I mean, it's the same thing when you hear people who are like, well, I would do, and I, I'll give you another one. Uh, we went to, to Chicago to go see Hamilton. Uh, my wife really wanted to go see it. And we went with a bunch of people uh, and we came out and one of her, a good friend of hers, we were sitting around at a bar after, and she's like, you know, the, the, there are some people who think that Burr and Hamilton based on their letters had a homosexual relationship. And we were, we were a couple beers in at this point, And I pretty much gave the Jeff answer. I'm like, that is blank and blankety blank. Stop making everything gay because it's not because they wrote differently back then. And you, you people try to apply your lens to it. And it's mm -hmm. just, it just, as Jeff says, it just upsets me. They're just trying to rewrite history to literally fit in their degenerate. So God forbid guys who are proud of their physique, you know, at a beach, want to, you know, show off their physique or whatever the case. I mean, look at bodybuilders now. We had a joke when we played rugby. There was this one guy, he lifted all the time. Every time he took a picture, guess what? His shirt came off because he was so proud of his the, of his physique. It was like being a bar at two in the morning. All of us are all clothed and his shirt's off because he wants to show off his muscles. That's just something, you know, you work hard for that kind of stuff. You might as well enjoy it. But yeah, the fact that they try to, as Jeff said, shoehorn anything and it is it is to destroy male bonding because that's why there's so many men who feel alone that's why there's so many men who are outcasts and because they they are not allowed to have that those kind of moments because it's like oh you're gay it's like okay fine and the fear of that rejection is just yeah i absolutely agree um one other thing i just wanted to add about Top Gun in general, the first one is I spoke with a Navy pilot because I was just curious uh, and I met up with him like, is it at all, you know, is the culture in any way similar to Top Gun? Like, did they nail it? Because like 
one of the older movies with Navy SEALs that has uh, Charlie Sheen in it is just so off the reservation. It is not at all what things are like as a Navy SEAL. And he's like, you know, I don't actually know if it's that they captured what it's like to be a Navy pilot or that it influenced and like made that (laughs) what it's like to be a Navy pilot. But he's like, it's actually very accurate as far as the amount of cockiness and egos writing checks that their bodies can't cash. Mm, Nice. That's hilarious. Um, But yeah, so Top Gun, a very influential and important movie that it came back, uh, you know, almost, almost 40 years or something like that. uh, And, kicked butt at the box office even as a sequel like mm-hmm. the, i mean that's just in great crazy in of itself mm-hmm. um and then so and then we're gonna move on to i don't know if you guys have anything to say about rain man um i've never seen it born on the fourth of july no nope. i haven't seen it okay uh, okay uh, a few good men now I, I sort of uh, proposed this uh, before, uh, prior to uh, recording. My my big thing is that they they got the villain of A Few Good Men got away with everything. Now they they paint Jack Nicholson's character as just the most awful human being alive, but it's mostly just because of the things he says, the language he uses. And him being just kind of an ass like that. Th- those that's the main. I mean, yes, there he's lied and he does. And he thinks that um, the Navy's rules on certain things are wrong. But basically, he his his strategy at the end of the day. And you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but I, it seems to be that he wants the uh, he wants the character who had di- that dies in the beginning of the movie. He wants him to be trained correctly since because since he is bo- medically supposed to be able to do all the things that is required of him. He just seems to be bad at doing it or lazy or something like that. But really, at the end of the day, the doctor, uh, uh, the medical doctor, seemingly just dis- uh, diagnoses him or misdiagnoses him uh, and basically puts this guy who basically shouldn't be in the military at all at risk uh during you know basically i mean he has trouble breathing and that sort of thing like that that seems like a really bad characteristic to have as a uh, marine and this doctor is basically tries to get out of any sense of responsibility for the death of the person which i mean there are elements of the movie that they're right about you know like you know, beating up people for being weak is not a, it's not, it's not a good strategy, but then again, this seemed to be sort of the expectation. Uh, and, um, the guy, I mean, one of the guys, one of the inconsistencies in the movie is the guy in trouble. For, one of the guys in trouble for beating up the, and, uh, sort of the death of this officer was the one protecting him all the time prior. So mm-hmm. it's just, it's a little inconsistent there, but the doctor basically, has a way out for all these people that you know sort of um the uh guy the main marines who have uh committed this act against this other officer that led to the uh, officer getting killed uh basically they're going to go to jail for the rest of their lives but this doctor stands by the fact that he could never have possibly made a mistake and that this isn't this isn't you know his fault which of course i don't know why he's the only doctor there's no other doctor that can review what the other doctor did which maybe is just an inconsistency of the movie and something they just wanted to uh you know move past but he just reminds me of a fauci character you know this mm-hmm. this uh doctor who sort of who creates all these problems weasels his way out of them and then kind of throws it on everybody else at the end so just to push, uh, yeah, I definitely agree that he is a, uh, he is an evil character, but to push back a little that he is the main villain. Initially, when the, um, 
when the victim is brought into the hospital, they don't know what it is. And then, um, you know, a few hours later after the colonel has had the chance to get in and basically force, um, you know, the narrative, then it comes back as this was poison leading to the lactic acidosis and all of that. So they're from the beginning, the biggest problem with the colonel isn't initially what he's doing with, you know, training, like there needs to be training of men. They do need to be able to do their physical duties, but he immediately goes into cover-up mode and not only is, um, you know, falsifying those medical rectors, he falsifies the log books for the flights that come in and out. He may have had a hand in forcing the doctor to say, no, there's no possible way this could have gone wrong. I, obviously, this is all just us reading into it at this point because we don't know for sure. But I think that um, to say that he, uh, the doctor is the main villain, you know, he also could have just in the same way that Colonel Jessup did make a mistake and then try to cover it up. But Jessup did that in a much more extreme and felonious way. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's Jessup's show. And mm -hmm. the reason I can tell you why there was no other doctor, because Jessup didn't allow him on the base. It's that simple. I mean, the, he, this guy was built up as to having huge or very well-placed connections throughout the entire military chain of command. Mm -hmm. uh, he's supposed to be the Joint Chiefs, the next general of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So, I mean, you don't get to that place without being able to sh – like, I mean, you made a whole flight disappear. So the well, fact he's able to do that. Yeah, and not only that, but that was one of the points that um, – was made as Tom Cruise was realizing that he needed to attack Jessup was like, why would they put this young uh, lawyer who has a notorious history of plea bargains onto this big thing? It's so that people aren't going to look into it because he has such a, you know, big future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They want it done quickly. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the, the doctor is definitely a villain for being complete, complacent and complying with everything that Jessup did, just like all the, everybody else outside of Kiefer Sutherland's ca character who's once again, a zealot, uh, and, and will do whatever he can for his own moving. Cause he understands if, as Jessup moves, if he's a, if he's a good soldier, he'll move up with him. Uh, and so that's, that's that regard. And so the, um, the, it, it, as much as we love Jessup, Jessup is the villain. I mean, the fact of the matter is he's the he is the guy who orchestrated all of that and he be his ego became bigger than what he was supposed to be doing in that regard. So he has the forcible will to uh convince doctors to you know toss aside their Hippocratic oath. And I think that I, I do I do say, uh Connor, you have a good insight into the God complex mm -hmm. that many doctors have. Uh, we have a family friend who is a brain surgeon in New Jersey and um, he's not a Catholic, but he's a, he is a, he is a very good Christian man. And I know this cause my dad, who is a very good cat, we try to be the best Catholic he could have been. Uh, he was his best friend. And he said, Rick, the, the reason why I love him so much, he's the only doctor I know who prays before surgery. And that's a very big insight to the fact that most doctors do not even the Catholic ones, because they are, and that's kind of trying to tie it back into a few good men. They have their own superiority God complex as to say, well, I couldn't have made a mistake. Now, some will say they need to have that. So when they're going into surgery, they don't doubt themselves. But at the same time, uh, it comes back to situations like you were pointing out. Yeah. yeah. It's and just, I absolutely see the connections with Fauci there. It's just Aaron yeah. Sorkin. It is sort of an annoying writer yes, because, he because he he so he builds Jessup overly into a villain, which you know, looking back on it, makes me like him <laughs> a little more than mm. uh, than I than I should, obviously, because I know what Sorkin's doing. I know that Sorkin is trying to make you uh, hate him over oh like you're he's trying to make him into somebody that kind of doesn't that almost doesn't exist like he goes he he's goes a caricature 
he goes demonic at the end, basically. So just to push back a little bit, though, I see from a plot line's perspective why that would be the case. He has to have such a huge inflated ego so that when he's being you know, questioned and you know, his authority is being usurped basically by Tom Cruise in the courtroom, he's going to have that epic, absolutely beautiful meltdown of a rant. Yeah, he needs to. He he actually he's almost like a serial killer in that regard, where a serial killer goes back to the scene of the crime. He need to observe his handiwork. Same thing. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, Jack Nicholson plays. Uh, what is it? What's that horror movie he's in? Um. Um. Which one? I can't remember what the name of the horror movie. A horror he's movie. In. Yeah, horror. the one where they're up in the mountains. The Shining. Yeah, yeah, the, the Shining. Shining. I mean, it's just the facial is the face is pretty, pretty similar. Um, and they're probably going for that. But the point is, is just that like Aaron Sorkin's playing his hand, you know, mm -hmm. like he's and it, it's it's irksome knowing that things are a little more complicated. Yeah, than that's what a perfectly he's fair. That's a perfectly fair point. But one thing I think we can all agree on is that the courtroom scenes are just truly fantastic and it's hilarious that um they they didn't shoot in sequence for the courtroom where they would you know have jack nicholson and tom cruise actually going back and forth but, you know they had tom cruise just do all of his lines and jack nicholson do all of his and while tom yeah. cruise was filming his lines jack nicholson was in the right, behind the camera making faces at him trying to get him to break character <laughs> Really? Okay. Well, uh, don't get me wrong. When I'm talking about just like the, oh yeah, uh, the, about them talking about sort of making uh, Jack Nicholson's character more, you know, caricature than he would be. I, I, the movie is fantastic. There is no doubt about that. It is so well done, and Tom Cruise is the his character is the best, and even by all standards, he is like he's a good character no matter what. Like mm -hmm. you can't argue like Demi Moore's character. The lady is very annoying, uh, but she's, and uh, she's certainly not the villain either, but uh, you know, we had to figure out a secret villain. That's all I'm saying is that there had to be a secret villain. Let me, um, Sorkin is a brilliant writer, but he is an ideologue. Oh, so yeah. his bad guys will be Republican. And they will be the caricature of or just watch the I, everybody was trying to tell me the West Wing was so great. And then 10 minutes into the first episode, one guy's talking about the Democratic platform, it's gun control, blah, 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 and how it's the most superior one. And I shut that thing off and I ever watched another second of it. I was like, this is garbage. Um, but he's still he, he's an ideologue and he's wordy. He is really wordy. Like he he will take he will do a figure eight to, to do what you could get done in a straight line um because he just he he is and he's very good i mean movies like the social network and and others are very good films where that dialogue is is very snappy and it and it it fires off nicely but yes when you look at his stuff you definitely can tell it's a sorkin movie even if you didn't know that it was a sorkin movie probably 20 minutes in with the way the dialogue is and how people are framed he definitely has no problem framing his his ideologues is good and his uh, his political opponents bad in that yeah. regard. So and yes, and and Cruz was fantastic. So was Nickel uh, Jack Nicholson. Obviously, he was fantastic. Demi Moore is Demi Moore, whatever. Kevin Pollock is really the guy that you know. He's the guy that get. He's that glue. He's and he's one of those actors that you need in a film like that because he doesn't mm -hmm. care about his own ego. He'll let everybody else, but he'll just kind of tie each scene together. And is so he, he's he's underrated. He's the underrated hero in that film. Is he Weinberg? Uh, he yeah yeah Lieutenant Weinberg. Weinberg. Yeah, yeah, I love that moment. It's like just you, you Lieutenant you. Weinberg. Yeah. It's also perfect for the name. It's just like sounds like whining, and yeah. I just think that anyways, it works perfectly. Kevin Bacon's also pretty good in that movie. Uh, oh, so yep. he plays his role very well. But and you know he doesn't overstep his role. He just. He stays in his box uh, and does a good job. Yeah, um, it is kind of interesting that in this, right, 
it seems like in all of his movies, Tom Cruise, uh, the way in which he's the pro- uh, protagonist is usually either that he sees something that other people don't, or that he's willing to take chances, like has the guts that others don't. But it's uh, other than you know, like the Mission Impossible movies. Usually, it's not that he's the moral compass of it, like because uh, Demi Moore is the moral compass of um, the movie, in my opinion. Like she's Absolutely. the one who's actually trying to get him to, you know, fight for these guys that are innocent. He just like he has the charisma in the courtroom, but that's it. Like he's not. Uh, he doesn't have that moral fortitude to actually take risks until he's, you know, like kicked into it as hard as can be. She also plays annoying moral compass pretty well too. Yeah. Which, yeah like, and it, moral compasses it, are generally annoying. Like if you're, if you're in the situation of making a hard decision and your moral compass, you know, even just like, you know, your conscience is getting in the way of you doing something the easy way. Mm-hmm. It, that probably is annoying for most people at least. Yeah, and it also just plays into her character of, you know, she takes one um, drunk and disorderly and drags it out for weeks on end. Like, she's not supposed to be charismatic or good with other people. Yeah, at least, you know, that's one thing. Uh, oh, one thing about, like, the Tom Cruise, uh, sort of the Mission Impossible movie I forgot about is that uh, Haley Atwell is allowed to not uh, not be good at everything. It, when she's um the she's just a thief she's good at being a thief that's what she's good at and she has vulnerable moments where she needs tom cruise to help her and i think that's uh that's something you rare you don't see that much in modern movies you don't you know see cruise won't allow her to upstage him so that, well, that's, yeah that's that simple fact which is fine if you if you had a harrison ford that was willing to do something like that then Indiana Jones wouldn't have been the absolute train wreck that it was. So it, it I'm fine with, you know, and, and we make fun of Vin Diesel that has turned himself into his own superhero with the 10th Fast and the Furious film, but he still protects that. And, in, and I mean, they still are f- part of that formula. I'm fine with a legacy character protecting the, the core of it. So it's not completely whacked around and, and recap or uh, what do they call it? Deconstructed. You know, if yeah. Mark Hamill had his own and I, I can't stand him. I get it. He's a P P O S, but if he had any kind of conviction, he would have walked off the set of the last Jedi and been like, I am not doing this. This is absolutely ridiculous. I, I don't care if you're the director, make this film, make this film without me because I am not going to do this. I don't even find me if I'm, you know, it, without actually asking men to be men and have some kind of resolve instead of just being pushovers. That's true. Mark Hamill would have had to be a man. And since he's a pathetic, Not. he's a pathetic man, baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, he, all he's going to do is complain about it afterwards, which is what he did. Yeah. He's a self-important pathetic man, baby. Well, yeah. aren't all man babies self-important? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I mean, it's all about them, but they just, but they also don't want to like put in the effort. I want to make some form of joke about Anthony, but he's don't a good do guy. It. So do I it, won't. do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Maybe later. Ah, uh, hey, we're already on such good cruise control right now. I don't want to derail us. Fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, good one. Cruise control. Thank you. And derail for off the rails. Oh yeah. But the Hoover. Okay. Now, <laughs> now, next, sort of the Mission Impossibles come in, and uh, also Jerry mm-hmm. Maguire, and the firm. I've also seen that. That one's creepy. Um, I don't know if you guys seen it, but uh, you can tell my parents really like Tom Cruise movies, just because, like, mm-hmm. I know. I love them too. Uh, I just haven't seen the firm. I know, but I'm just really, you know, I'm much younger than you guys, so like, <laughs> I should know less Tom Cruise movies. By uh, you know, theoretically at least. But so we have the Mission Impossible movies. He's becoming you know an action. He this is his beginning an action hero thing, and he seemed like he chose this. He he specifically chose 
uh, doing the Mission Impossible movies. Also, he's a producer on the Mission Impossible movie. That's his first producer credit. Mm -hmm. So this is his this is this is more him getting into, like, I think his choice films, the kind of character he wants to be. That's at least that's what I take from him becoming a producer. Any 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 thoughts on that? Well, I, as much as we don't like deconstructing characters and deconstructing stories, the Mission Impossible, the 1996 one was actually really one of the first ones to kind of apply that formula. Um, Phelps. Isn't it is uh, not. Fel yeah. Phelps was actually the hero of the TV show. And the guy who was supposed who played Phelps in the TV show was offered the role that went to um, Voight. And he said no, because he didn't. He thought it was a uh, it was a, a, a turning a betrayal of the character uh, oh. because, you know, he's like, why would why would he be a bad guy? Uh, but um they they deconstructed Mission Impossible and rebuilt it around Tom Cruise. And yeah. so that's very interesting. Well, that was a really big twist that, you know, was a good surprise. Like, what the heck just happened? For a 1996 movie. Yeah. Also, blows my mind that in Dead Reckoning Part 1, Tom Cruise is older than John Voight was. In right. Mission Impossible One. Wait, seriously? That's, That's serious. He's one hundred percent right. Wait, and John Voight looks like he's like he. Could... He looks seventy. Yeah, to be fair, like... John Voight looks seventy since he was twenty-two. Well, that's why yeah, I was. I was also fair. like same with Morgan Freeman. I was looking at Morgan Freeman when he like in the eighties and nineties. I'm like, he doesn't look like he's that much younger than what he does look like now. Yeah. Anyway, so I guess there's just some. What's what's in the water these days? That's what I want to know. Well, I think I'm pretty sure there was a little, let's be real. There was a little bit of de-aging on, on Cruise. If you look at him on the press store, he don't look anything like, like he is in that. Of course, that film was what, two years ago as well. Yeah. It's so. been, a, it's been a couple years since he filmed. So Dead there's Reckoning. a little de-aging on that as well. So, so I guess he showed his age gracefully, in my opinion, in Top Gun Maverick. Yes. That's true. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Anyways, it's it's very but, interesting that he I didn't realize that the movie was a deconstruction. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's crazy. But it is also interesting just how different that was versus what it has become. Mm -hmm. Like it was it very much started off as much more like a spy thriller. And the uh, at least, you know, four through six were or I'd say three through six were really much more like heavy action films than it was really the spy intrigue because I, it was also a lot easier to just say like, okay, we know the face mask is getting ripped off at some point. Like <laughs> it was less of a uh, surprise by then. Also um, that started though. The crazy thing is because people wanted that, that big blowout action set piece they tried to do at the end of one with the helicopter and the train and stuff. And I agree. We watching all of them. Uh, one is, is very good. One is very good. It's very well paced and, and, and all that. But for some reason they felt like either they didn't know who the character was or they didn't have a, a uh, they weren't happy with the return. So then they went absolutely nuts with two, which is the one that doesn't hold up in my opinion uh, at all the, out of all of them, the rest of them kind of do hold up in one way, shape or form. Uh, but two is an absolute whack. Then they brought in JJ Adams for three to kind of reset everything. Um, and then four, five, four was Brad bird. I believe his name is who directed it. Then five on was McQuarrie. So, and so that's why you've had kind of a consistency uh in that nature four was um what was it uh what's that movie um the what's that uh that incredibles, uh, incredibles. yes incredibles mm -hmm. he's uh uh that lady voice act or he voices the um the small lady I can't remember. <laughs> what's her yeah. name uh, <laughs> edna mole edna mode yeah he voices Edna Mode. So Edna Mode directed the uh, the fourth. Did you say the fourth one? Yes. Yeah. And That's so that is really bizarre. Just thinking about that. 
but yeah, so they don't really, they, definitely, they don't really know where this is going. And they're just kind of testing the waters, I would say, with Mission Impossible 1. But also, mm. when they deconstructed the character of, like, uh, Phelps, you know, mm. they they didn't replace him with some really weak character, like a pathetic human being. Like, they replaced him with another heroic figure. That, mm -hmm. like, like, somebody who could sort of... Uh, I don't know, still had some masculinity. Like when they just deconstruct these characters in modern films, they basically uh, either they replace them with a woman or they sort of lower them to pathetic status. Like Phelps is a quality villain in this. At least he's qual a quality villain. He's not just somebody to make fun of. That's a good yep. point. So yep. there, at least it had some purpose and some, you know, replacement mentality and no, no way that that guy was going to like, no way that that old character was going to be able to continue on that long. Mm -hmm. like, well, the whole point of it, when you had Cruz at that point was to build that franchise around him. Yes, exactly. And then um, the director of the second movie is, so the first, the third one was Brian De Palma, I think. De Palma was one. Oh, De Palma was John one. Woo oh, John and his Woo pigeons was. or doves was not was the second one. Yeah, which is one. why you know you get that meme to this day of doves flying through an explosion. You can thank that movie, JJ. Yeah, JJ Brad Bird, and then McQuarrie from there on out. And you know, I really got into it more once, um, you know, Ghost Protocol. That was mm -hmm. when. I think I I think the first movie I actually saw might have been in the theaters was uh, Rogue Nation, and then I went back uh, to all the other movies, and yeah, I the second one's obviously the weakest. The first one's pretty good. The third one, it's sort of middle of the road to me. I don't know if you guys feel strongly about that one, and then yeah. the. Ghost Protocol is basically half a half a great movie and kind of half a boring one, in my opinion. And then Rogue Nation is the ideal one. Yeah, I I would I would agree with uh, pretty much all of this. I think that what has made it continue to get better, like or what for me has helped me to get more emotionally invested with each passing movie is slowly adding to the continuing re um, cast that you know will reprise their roles like having simon Pegg throughout so many of these movies i had no clue like until i went back and started watching them again that he started so early in the series and seeing his character evolve and seeing um you know jeremy renner continue to come back after ghost protocol and I, I don't remember the name of the actor but you know his black sidekick that you know has come oh, back Vin Rames. Vin yeah. Rames. Vin Rames, yeah he's um having that you know slowly getting invested in more than just Tom Cruise for me has elevated the emotional stakes of the movies like you know he we know Simon Pegg and the risk that he's taking when he's um you know getting that information to him in Rogue Nation like there's a heightened sense of the stakes and what could happen because we actually care about his uh, previously just revolving cast of characters yeah and i i miss Jeremy Renner he he wasn't in Fallout because they offered him a chance to reprise, but only for him to die in the first like scene or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he said no. And that and that's probably the best situation uh, for him, because mm -hmm. if they want to ever bring him back, if I was him, I would say not unless it's a, you know, a sizable role, which yeah. I actually I thought his I thought his character was kind of an ideal uh, foil to mm -hmm. uh, to Tom Cruise's. But, you know, they so I don't know if he'll come back. The Avengers got in the way of him coming into um, many, uh, multiple of the movies since. So I don't know if I don't know if he'll ever make a reprisal 
but I would hope so. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought I, I'm I'm a sucker for anything Renner is in. I, I he's one of the few that I'll make I'll make time to see. Um, the the whole the thing is with three, it really showed that you know they it, kind of the Top Gun syndrome was that people were expecting an action movie with Tom Cruise and, and the spy thriller while good people were not really there for that. Maybe if you had somebody different, they would be. And so two, they kind of just copied the matrix, right? Leather, black leather stunts, crazy, you know, um, there's a really good breakdown. Somebody, uh, somebody on YouTube did a breakdown about, um, the, the identity of Ethan Hunt through all of these. And he calls, uh, mission impossible in the thinker, Mission Impossible 2, Thinker Ethan Hunt, then Mission Impossible 2, Action Ethan Hunt, and then Mission Impossible 3, Normal Ethan Hunt. Because that, and it's a wildly inconsistent tone between the three films uh, because they didn't have it planned out. Not like today, as Jeff said, where you plan every sequel out or you, you know, you're teasing for the next sequel that's already in development for the next movie, consume next product type of idea. Mm -hmm. Um, so after three, which some people like, and the only really redeeming thing about three is Phil, Philip Seymour Hoffman's villain, who yeah. is just, you have to, no matter, because Rogue Nation's villain is super weak compared to Seymour Hoffman. I mean, I think that was the last time before, um, really, the villain upstaged Cruz in any of these films. Because, I mean, most of the other ones really haven't been any kind of name worthy guys maybe except henry cavill right henry cavill who was a surprise yeah. one really really good because that was a great cross that was a great double cross they could have they could have had i like yeah, they could have had henry cool. cavill been the replacement too yeah well i as, also as much as i despise him as a person having alec baldwin oh. come in where you thought that he was going to be the villain was a perfect placement. Oh yeah, he played it perfectly. I just love that they killed him off right before he killed someone in real life. <laughs> yeah, when he holds the gun up in that movie, you're like, "Watch out! <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, Henry! Watch out!" <laughs> no, <laughs> it's but, like you it's know, Superman because he might pop one on you. <laughs> like right before, but right before that happens, they actually kill him in the in the, and then they yeah. then they don't have to make up some reason for why he didn't come back or anything like that. So uh, yeah, it's kind of you know it, you know you know Alec Baldwin's a ter seems like a terrible human being, but he he does have good acting chops for sure. Yeah. Um, anyways, and then so the. Uh, Sort of the last couple or last two things that I just wanted to mention. Well, actually, three things. So there's a romantic action movie that Tom Cruise does called Night and Day. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Um, it's kind of an interesting movie with um, who is it with? It's with Cameron Diaz. It's a it's an entertaining movie. Uh, he does Valkyrie, where he's uh, tries to assassinate uh, the you know, the German painter. Uh, and, um, and then we have Austrian painter. Oh, fine. Austrian painter. <laughs> fine, 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 fine. And so. then, uh, Top Gun Maverick is also, and then oblivion oblivion. I recently watched that very good movie though. I, I I I have to think about that movie a lot and maybe watch it again because to me there's just seemingly a lot there uh, to really think fun. about. Also, it's great with Morgan Freeman. Yeah, uh, right, one one other that I want to throw in that I don't think gets enough. Uh, all right, say. yeah, credit is um, Edge of Tomorrow. Yep, absolutely. I think that this I uh, to me this is the movie that most perfectly encapsulates what is great about Tom Cruise because like you first have him purely just trying to get by off of his charm where he doesn't want to go into battle like he um, and he's just trying to talk his way out of things it shows just general acting chops to be able to 
you know, go through the same thing again and again with slightly different variations. Like he's learning as he goes, but then his emotional connection with Emily Blunt is phenomenal. Just like, you know, like, well, what actually is your middle name? And then it also shows perfectly like how, you know, freaking fantastic he is, as we all know, as an action hero. It's like he hits all of his highlights in that single role, but he's also not purely taking over everything where Emily Blunt also has massive moments that she just shines in that. So like he doesn't prevent her from taking that limelight when it's necessary. So that's one of my favorite like i don't think it's a perfect movie i don't think it's as good as top gun maverick but it's really watchable it's really entertaining and it just shows within you know two hours the entire range of what tom cruise is capable of except for him as a villain which we see in collateral and i agree with that completely i will add i think it's two more Mm -hmm. um if it was but if it was a film with any other name it would be revered as one of his best because it's got rewatchability and i watch it's one of my guilty pleasure movies you know where i'm going jeff yes exactly. <laughs> if it was anything else if it was tommy o'toole you know and the and the pittsburgh detective or whatever people would say this the range he gives and the, the detachment he has and the rage he's able to bring on command and the, the physicality despite being my height, but the physicality he brings to the role is, is unbelievable. I remember I watched it because it was on one of the, the streaming channels and I was like, Oh, whatever. It's a Saturday afternoon. It's not. And I just fell in love with it. And I was like, I looked at my wife when she came on, I'm like, you got to watch this film. And then she watched and she's like, this is incredible. I can't believe we, you know, we, and it's in, it's unfortunate that it's named that it, if it was anything else, people would be saying, it's amazing. And it's not his fault. They gave him the role. He just, he takes acting jobs where he can take them. And the second film that we, we missed that um, I would say minority report is a pretty decent film mm-hmm. that we, we forget Tom. He's really good in the, in that sci-fi area, telling sci-fi stories with minority yeah, report, oblivion. Like, I repeat, oblivion, those mm-hmm. kinds of things, those sci-fi action films uh, by no means is minority report a great film. But it's definitely an entertaining film. It's a definitely it's got some great elements to it. it and that was right before Spielberg kind of just like fell off a cliff creatively. It's one of his last really good films that he was able to put together. Him and um, uh, the guy who directed uh, Gladiator, um, the, the that guy, they Ridley both. Have fallen, yeah, they've both fallen, which is why the Napoleon film I am not high on. I am not high on that film in any way, shape, or form. I saw your video on it, Connor, and yeah, I agree with a lot of the other guys there. Um, I think that movie's all hype, no, all, all, all saddle, no horse on that one. Uh, but I would say Minority Report is something definitely people could watch. I, I agree, Night and Day, fun because he just he embraced the, his wackiness on that one, and he mm. was just like whatever. And Jack Reacher, if you can get past the name and just be like. Okay, isn't it? He's not the Jack Reacher. He just happens to be named Jack Reacher. He plays that. I think it's it's an underrated performance on that. People, you know, overlook yeah. it. Unfortunately, because of the material. That's very much how I feel about John Krasinski playing Jack Ryan. Like he's not actually playing Jack Ryan. He's uh, it's got the same name, but it is not the same character. Uh, I do think that there is one cinematic masterpiece that we have failed to mention that is probably the best movie that he has appeared in. Tropic Thunder. Yep. Yep. As, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. That's probably his most quotable role. That's probably his most quotable role. Many a quote has been said on a basketball court from him or during uh, many a trash talk has used Lex Grossman to yeah to I, make a point. there aren't many comedies we see with him in it and he fits that role just perfectly because nobody knew until the credits came up i didn't catch it until and then we were all like you got to be kidding me 
And then yeah. when you rewatch her, you're like, oh, yeah, that's totally him. But <laughs> you wouldn't expect him to put on that much makeup mm-hmm. and just curse everybody out to high heaven <laughs> with <laughs> everything. So you're Bas- right. Basically, what I've gathered from this conversation is that it could go for four hours, you know, if uh, if we really wanted to. Um, but uh, for another time. So uh any anything you guys want to add before before we wrap things up? Mm, Jeff, you got any? Uh I just want to say I really appreciate you guys having me on. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, if there's any topics you'd like for me to join in on in the future, please just let me know. Awesome. Well, it was ha- it was great having you, Jeff. You you had a, you add great knowledge and insight to this conversation. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Rick, what um also i'm sorry i gotta throw him in last samurai last <laughs> samurai is a fantastic film too yes uh okay. I, I just i bought it because it was on sale on voodoo like a week ago and i was super pumped to get that one in there but i mean that's just also it, it, uh t- did you ever see uh, austin powers gold member when he does the cameo the crazy thing is he does these like cameo things which yeah. you would think a guy of his stature wouldn't do but yet you always see him like kind of pop up in these things, either Lex, Lex Grossman or being Dr. E, or being Austin Powers and Austin Powers and gold member. Um, and so uh, this kind of stuff, a lot of fun. I love talking film uh, and, you know, it's always a great time, Connor. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining Rick. Uh, everyone, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Join the discord. If you're interested in continuing these types of conversations, off of you know podcasts and and you get a chance to interact with me more um more easily instead of just the comment section you can find jeff at jeff catholic on twitter uh rick can be found at the armed catholic as on uh, twitter and on uh youtube and um where else rick rumble spiritus those are the uh three places you can find it um yeah just search the arm catholic you'll find them on all those awesome well thank you all for watching and god bless everyone bye